Hi, you're listening to Crime Tapes. This is a podcast made in association with the School of Law, Policing and Forensics at Staffordshire University. The theme of the podcast is is crime and, and real crime, and each week we're, we're joined by a guest um, to discuss a, a topical and issue on, on crime. Actually, this week is both topical and, and in some ways historically focused, because this week we're going to be looking at the, the history of, of capital punishment. Now, in Britain, that is history, but in the United States of America and in other countries, capital punishment is, is still used today. So the use of the death penalty continues, and it continues to, to be debated. Our guest this week is Dr Joe Turner, a criminologist at Staffordshire University, whose specific interests uh, lie both in the death penalty and in the history of crime. Um, myself, Professor James Treadwell, and my co-presenter... Sidekick. Sidekick. <laughs> Kyla, we're, we're going to have a conversation about the death penalty and the death penalty's place both historically in society and both back in debates about crime and punishment in the UK today. Now, over the years, capital punishment in Britain has, has varied widely and, and of course today we, we no longer use it. At one point, it was one of the most gruesome and infamous punishments that the state could inflict. Forms of execution, for example, included hanging, drawing and quartering. That would have been the punishment symbolically used, for example, in the gunpowder plotters that you know we mark in November. Um, we had a spectacular array of, of capital punishments in, in the United Kingdom. In 1822, 222 capital offences lay on statute. And over the years, gradually, that was diminished. Um, and we no longer, of course, use capital punishment in the United Kingdom. But, of course, with debates raging about our place in the world around Brexit, capital punishment is in some ways, creeping back into the political agenda. Of course, the prohibitions on use of capital punishment in the United Kingdom come from and are set around treaties involving the European Union, whereas other countries, the United States of America, China and others, still have execution as part of the repertoire of punishments that the state can draw on. The USA, one of the Western countries that still practices capital punishment, it's still legal to, to use it in 29 out of 50 states. And execution is now largely by way of lethal injection. Previously, the most f popular forms of execution were electric chair, for example, whereby the person sat on a wooden chair and was electrocuted to death through the skull and legs. This form of execution has been usually part of popular culture and focused in on by films like The Green Mile and, and the series prison break and of course shocker the, that horror film that most it's, people haven't it's, seen it's i'm horrific, sure but it's, it, 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 yeah. you know but but kyla as you can tell is is a fan of of horror yes now of course other countries south korea and and china where they don't actually record number of executions or publicize them but it's estimated by some like amnesty international that up to 2000 executions are carried out a year use different mechanisms and in the United Kingdom, we're debating capital punishment, particularly because we now have a Home Secretary who has expressed support in the form of Priti Patel, and also because of that context of, of Britain and its place in the world post-Brexit. And, and it may well become, again, part of the political landscape of discussion. And, of course, students studying criminology and and courses linked to it, including criminal justice and law, will often look at the history of, of capital punishment and, and they'll look at how capital punishment is understood, thought of, talked about, debated, both historically and in the world today. And ultimately, that's what we're going to do in this podcast. So I'm joined by Joe Turner. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Hi, Joe. Um, now, you know a little bit about the history of capital punishment in the, the United Kingdom and mm -hmm. now we tend, we tend to sort of forget that it was used but in actuality capital punishment is, has been a long part of our criminal history hasn't it? Can you tell us Absolutely. a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Okay, then. So, so we've always, um, right up until 1964, had capital punishment as a form of punishment. So, you know, in prehistory, it was just a, a routine way of 
dealing with really serious offenders and the, the not so serious offenders. And you also mentioned um, in 1822, I think you said, so at the beginning of the 19th century, we had over 200 crimes on statute books that carried the death penalty as a punishment. Um, now, I can go into, you know, I, I can tell you that um, although all those crimes carried the death penalty, very few were actually inflicted because people appealed against the sentence and they would either be transported for life instead of being hanged and um, they might have been um, just given some, you know, a lesser form of punishment yeah. um, rather than, as I say, being hanged. So so people were, um, although those crimes carried the death penalty as a punishment, they weren't all... It, all used. It wasn't just that people could be transported instead of being instead of being put to death. Um, a lots of juries, because they weren't happy with the the punishment that that crime carried, would what we call re- return perverse verdicts. So it might be that somebody was clearly um, guilty of a crime, but the jury would say they're not guilty because they weren't happy with that form of punishment that was going to be inflicted if they'd said guilty. So in fact. It was what we call uncertain. So, so that all those crimes carried the death penalty in the beginning of the nineteenth century, but um, it was an uncertain form of punishment right. because there were so many ways to circumvent that actually being carried out. So, over the next, I don't know, fifty, sixty years, it gradually reduced. So that by the second half of the nineteenth century, there were then only five crimes that carried the death penalty and that included things like treason uh, murder it significantly reduced it wasn't necessarily because it was humanitarian they didn't agree that you know we could argue that it was to make it more certain so so if you were convicted of one of those five crimes then you would face the death penalty so in fact you know o- over the 19th century and into the 20th century we get these um these calls for um particularly the, towards the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, calls for abolition of the death penalty. And they those debates carry on right through to the post-Second World War period where it becomes a really strong voice and a really strong debate. And, you know, uh, 1964 was the last time anybody was actually hanged and 1969 was when the, the bill was passed that, um, that they were going to what we call suspend capital punishment and then 10 years later it, it was finally in force but actually interestingly we we continue to have it in force up until 1999 treason. Um, for treason so it was the european union convention on human rights and signing up to the 13th and 6th Pro- protocol that that's when we had to abolish it totally so in fact it was a really really you know virtually at the you know going into the 21st century that we finally got rid of capital punishment and a lot of people don't realise that but in fact the last person that we hanged was 1964 so one of the big debates really and one of the interesting questions is why we got rid of it how those debates um, were successful you know those abolitionists were successful so, you know what what did we have to put into place to appease all the people that still wanted to continue because in fact popular opinion when we did abolish it, the majority of the population was still in favour of having the uh, the death penalty. So, I mean, interesting for our time now that it was it's a sort of politics against uh, yeah, public absolutely. demands. It, yeah. it was politicians were saying, no, a- a- actually, even though the public are in favour, we think that there's something more important here as a as a yeah. principle. Yeah. And yeah. so we're acting against what was the majority public interest yeah. as yeah. polled at the time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but but of course that also becomes interesting when we think, for example, about what public attitudes and public sentiments might support today, yeah. both in the United Kingdom and in the United States of America. Yeah, absolutely. I guess as well that for countries where there still is the death penalty, there's there are potentially some really interesting lessons in how the United Kingdom came to abolish. So. You were saying it, that was a much longer trajectory in some ways than, than a sort of immediate, um, you know, oh, we're into the 1950s in England, post-war period, and we're going to get rid of the death penalty. Because, of course, if you think about it, we'd, you know, Albert Perrypoint had executed Nazi war criminals Absolutely, for the yeah. British state. Yeah, yeah. You know, in a fairly recent history, we weren't wholly adverse to, to the use of execution. Um and people were still largely supportive. 
How then did we come to... How, how, why then did there become a political consensus around abolition? OK, well, I think I think part of those debates um, in the post-war period were about... So there were some really high-profile cases where people did face a death penalty and the death penalty was carried out, where there were real questions about the the innocence of the person that, that was... Um, because, of course, the thing about the death penalty, you know, it can't be reversed... Yeah, so so you can have miscarriages of justice where people go to prison for a long period of time, and then they find you know other evidence comes to light, and then they're released because there's, there's a retrial and they're released. So even if they've been in prison for a long time, they, they do get the liberty eventually, you know. But if if you're innocent of a murder and you have been hanged, then there's there's no coming back from that. So there were some real high profile cases where you know, the question of innocence was being raised. So when you talk about that, for me, obviously everyone knows I'm a bit of a film buff. Uh, the film, Let Him Have It, has anyone else seen that? Yeah, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah, so that's the Derek Bentley case when we talk about, you know, we can't bring it back. This guy was put to death for aid, is it, it's, uh, I was going to say aiding and abetting, but um, no. It, it was a sort of joint joint enterprise Surprise, yeah joint enterprise in a way i think i think mentally abetting was a yeah. term used he had a whole host of sort of um development problems his reading age was was it age four, 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 was, four yeah. yeah very very low iq and he was he there was a robbery that went wrong and a police officer was shot now at one point the police officer was pleading pleading with the other guy who was only 15 at the time his name was chris Christopher Craig to give him the gun. So Derek says, let him have it. Now, surrounding that, everyone is like, did he say let him have it as in shoot him or did he actually mean give him the gun? Well, on the strength of that, he was put to death. Yeah, I mean, because actually Bentley himself was only 19, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was only 19 yeah. himself. So um, with, and I don't think he was 19 in in, no, in his no, mental years at all. He was, he was like a child. And it, uh, yeah, those those sorts of that sort of case. What was the reaction to that, Joe, amongst the public? So, so this is just one one of a few cases where people were actually questioning whether or not the right verdict had been reached, and even if even if it was the right verdict, whether or not he should have been hanged, even even if you know that's what he did mean, should he face the death penalty, given the fact that his mental age was so low, his IQ was so low. And I mean, now, somebody with, with a similar sort of mental age and IQ, we, we would be saying that they weren't even fit to plead, weren't even fit to stand trial. So, you know, we're able to, but you I know, suppose, the capacity wasn't there. I suppose in some ways, the 1950s would have been yep. quite a different era yeah. as well. Though. Yeah. So you've, yeah. got, you've got sort of this ingrained idea of respect for the police and mm-hmm. authority. Yeah, but, I mean, I still, I, th- I think you still have that. Yeah, you, you definitely yeah. still have oh, that. So, so you know, if um, I think that's one of the one of the main sort of if, if you look at opinion polls as to how and why people would bring back the death penalty, I think paedophilia and killing police officers are the two top. Yeah, I mean, if, even if you just look at common assault now, if it's a common assault against emergency worker, that carries a higher sentence mm. than it would do if it was a common assault against me or you in the street. Yeah. Do you think at the time though that, that whereas politicians were able to sort of say, you know, this is something that uh, this is abysmal that this has been allowed to happen through the sort of facilitated by law the public were more sort of thinking well this is just a blip or or can we can we not say no no i don't think so i think i think there were definitely politicians as well so the people in parliament that were also arguing that in fact that this shouldn't have happened so so i think it was split It, it was just generally split but it was the question of innocence so a lot around this case so it was joint enterprise so he hadn't even pulled the trigger so so he hadn't done the, the killing in the first place he's got a such low mental age and even if he had have pulled the trigger you know should he have even stood trial so so those questions were happening those debates were happening at the time and i think it as i say it was there were a series of these sorts of cases where the public were becoming more vocal and politicians were becoming stronger in their their abolitionist uh, stance. So it, it it was a general thing that was happening. But it, yeah, so it, I suppose it's a it's sort of a time of tension now because at the same time, uh, Bentley's parents are 
petitioning and they're saying, yeah. you know, don't don't carry this out. But ultimately, the the state do the, end the, up the, yeah, the, e- executing. The, the, yeah, the state do. A, yeah. a man with a mental age of, yeah. of ten, ten and a half, um, yeah. and an IQ of around about sixty six. Yeah. And that, yeah. that yeah. and as you say, it sort of brings into stark relief, really, the uh, the, the fact that there is no correction once you've, you've gone to, to that length. And I mean, uh, you know, he has had a posthumous pardon since then, and the murder conviction in nineteen ninety eight was was quashed so so you know i mean okay it's taken a long time and a lot of petitioning to, to get to that point so so we, we we look at it now and and look at it with our modern day eyes you know so it was a very different it was a different time it was a post-war period um i think the know. notion of childhood was different back then as well wasn't it yeah yeah absolutely i, I suppose both yes and, and no because the, yeah. you know the great yeah, adolescence the great, mainly the great irony of it in some ways was that uh, that his accomplice who actually did pull the trigger yeah, that's right. was was not executed that's on the yeah. basis of being, being a, a child, child. Yeah. so yeah. it shows it perhaps in some ways it shows the um the, the fact that the law will always throw up these yeah. sort of spectacular yeah. injustices yeah. in a way i was going to say i think it was in 1908 that the the children's act said that you know anybody under the age of 18 couldn't face a death penalty mm. so up until that point children yeah. anybody over the age of seven could face the death penalty and they were hanged yeah definitely uh, i mean there's there's certainly uh, evidence yeah. from history i think it's um again uh, not my fault but uh, i think it's debated how young the youngest person to be executed in the uk throughout history is but but there are some estimations that it occurred at seven yeah um yeah so i think if you look at um, if, I think if you want to see young, you need to look at the royalty and how they executed children that had stakes to claim to the throne because that would have been a lot younger. I mean, you got princes in the tower that we don't even know what happened to those guys. No, they no, went missing. Right. They were very small yeah, children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and certainly... yeah, I think we're looking at murder there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Although but, at the end of the day, when you, they saw it, that one would, would have been murder, wouldn't it? But they but, saw it as execution when yeah. it was... But certainly, the, the state was willing to mm, execute at, at yeah. quite a quite young a age. young age, yeah, you yeah. know. And if, if it was felt that at that young age they understood right from wrong, mm. yes. So, yeah. so at that, so between sort of seven and fourteen, you had to be able to prove that they understood right from wrong, absolutely, to, to be able to, you know. And it's it's interesting because um, again you can tend to think of that as quite dated historically, but yeah. but classically it's there in in Oliver Twist, for example, yeah, who absolutely. is you know so it's it's Dickensian era of yeah. you know well this is this is likely to be a p- habitual pickpocket yeah. of the criminal yeah. orders yeah. Yeah. rather than transport immediately or pass a sentence of death, which yeah. may then be carried out or, or it may be commuted yeah. to transport. Although it does still happen in other countries oh, where that, children are executed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we've obviously we're talking about children in the United Kingdom. It's also the case that some of the the sort of classic examples in in some ways of the use of the death penalty and the most controversial use of the death penalty involved children. For example, in the United States of America, so the case of uh, George Stinney Jr. isn't there, Kyla, from yeah. America in the, the 1940s. It's not one I know as much about, but you do. Can you tell us a bit about it and what happened? Basically, 1944, 14-year-old uh, lad gets convicted of killing two young girls and raping them. He didn't do it. He was set up from the onset and then he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. He was so small that they had to sort of like boost him up to be able to fit in this chair. Mm. He was a child. Mm. And um, obviously, they've now exonerated him. He's yeah. He never did it. But at the time, it just... it This is an embodiment. It's not just looking at what the issues are surrounding the death penalty, but it to me, it encapsulates the problems in America with ingrained racism at, at that time. Yeah, because he was a black youth accused of killing white girls. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's something in that as well with capital punishment traditionally, Joe, isn't there, in that it's not just the sentence of execution, as, as it mm-hmm. were. It's not just the act of taking someone's life away. Yeah. But capital punishment for the state has a sort of symbolic effect. Yeah. It, it, it's Absolutely. more than just the crime itself. Can you can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, OK. Well, I mean, you know, in, in history, when we look at capital punishment, it's, it's about the state ownership of, of a, a body so so we, we wouldn't consider ourselves now 
as being owned by the state, but certainly, oh, you know... Are. Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, that, Our that, resident that, Marxist speaks. <laughs> that, 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 that's a different uh, conversation, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to that perhaps another week. But, you know, when we go back in history, so so the practice of hanging and drawing and quartering, it was saying, essentially, you know, if you try and kill a king, this is what we will do to your body, and we have the absolute right to do this to your body. So all sorts of corporal punishments, whether it be whipping, branding, chopping off hands, Hands, hanging people was all about ownership of the body. So it was about sort of the state obl- obliterating, but there was yeah. more behind it in, in, than that as well in, in things like hanging, drawing and quartering, wasn't there? That yeah. You need to understand the sort oh. of religious context. Oh, of- yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, the, the, the Christian ideal of um, a body being buried in consecrated ground and that person being able to then, you know, go, go up to heaven, to, to God. Um, so by... Um, quartering a body you are um, making sure that it's not a whole body and then you you either burn the ashes or or you bury the body in unconsecrated ground so effectively saying this body can never go up to heaven so so that was a punishment in itself because the, the hanging itself could kill you or probably would kill you the quartering was done afterwards so why why quarter a body that's already dead? Well, the symbolic action of, in there is the religious, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about the process of these morbid acts? Of- yeah, OK. Well, it, it was done differently in different places, really. So, um, you know, uh, Foucault starts his book Discipline and Punisher uh, by giving a description of how Damiens was, who, who was accused of regicide, which is trying to kill the king. So he was he was hanged so people would be hanged so they would either have died from from being hanged or would have passed out by that point and then they were quartered so usually the quartering and this is what Foucault describes is um, a horse at each part of each limb being tied to one of four horses and then each of those four horses being made to to run in opposite directions and that literally tore the body apart Um, and then those body parts could either be just burned and the ashes scattered or those body parts could be sent to different parts of of the country as as an example of what would happen so that that was essentially hanging drawing and quartering it, it's important to note though that this was a practice not just being carried out in england it was carried out in in many continental countries so it was it wasn't just england but it was also extremely rare so this is you know we're, we're talking about treason so somebody's got to either kill or try and kill the king or the queen you know it wasn't it wasn't a generalized way of punishing somebody and it was very spectacular people were encouraged to watch you know they, they, there was a really symbolic element to what they were doing wasn't most executions public Alan? yeah absolutely so so the hanging i mean our main way of executing people would be hanging so so people in the past have been beheaded but that was a practice that was stopped really quite a long time ago obviously on the continent again you know we look at france beheadings were were, you know something that were carried out probably more frequently than here um they made a machine yeah you know for that (laughs) yeah absolutely um so so we do have we we used to hang people essentially so years gone by people would have been made to stand on a cart and have the the rope round the neck and then the cart would be pulled away and they would they, they would hang there until they died now you know sometimes that that was done in such an imprecise way that it could actually take quite a long time for somebody to die so the body would would twitch so it wasn't uncommon for relatives to go along and pull on the legs of the person being hanged to speed it up and it became over a period of time more um more precise so we went from the cart that was pulled away so people were hanged to having trap doors on on stages where people were hanged and the, the trap door was pulled away and or, or they were stood on a chair but then you know we would they were looking then at the the length of the rope to make it more precise but again we still had for some people really quite a long time it it wasn't a quick death and some people survived and you know if you've survived the hanging you were allowed Mm. to then live yeah i I, (laughs) there's a story i went when i went to edinburgh one year um, and we had did one you know the ghost stores obviously Mm -hmm. um and 
apparently the, the, there was a woman that survived hanging and she was allowed to let that off but then they changed it to you, basically you will hang till you to your dead whereas if it, you just get tried and hung or hanged yes oh, God, yeah here we go with hung hanged <laughs> yeah um so so they added in that clause hanging till uh, hanging by the neck till, till you're dead, dead. Yeah, so so that that was to stop that practice of people being al- allowed to live after trying to hang. But then we move later into the the late nineteenth century into the twentieth century, where it became really really precise. So Albert Pierpoint was um, famous or infamous really in his very meticulous calculations of how long the rope needed to be for somebody to to be hanged quickly. And that's why he became, I suppose, really so successful and so much in demand. You know, it's interesting to know that during the 20th century, the early 20th century, Ireland did not have a hangman and we had, and they had to borrow Albert Pierre Point to go over to Ireland to hang people. So he was really very much in demand because of his... his he's he's yeah. a fascinating individual mm, as absolutely. well because he, write, he writes an autobiography where ultimately he comes out, he becomes one of the campaigners against yeah. capital punishment. Yeah, that's right. Um, and if you haven't seen Film, Kyla. There, there's a there's just Timothy say, Spall <laughs> plays him, and it's it's a really film. it's a really really good. I it's one of Timothy Spall's oh, best portrayals yeah, of, yeah, and yeah. It, it's it's an absolutely great film. Um, but but yeah, when you were saying Joe about that sort of cultural um, connection in a, in a way, and uh, when you were saying about the friends and family of the victims yeah. pulling on the leg, that's yeah. that's where the expression pulling my leg yeah, comes from yeah, and yeah. similarly you know how many of us talk about having a terrible hangover that the hangover in and of itself is yeah. is the celebration mm-hmm. of of the That's executed right. person's life yeah. that their friends do afterwards where yeah. they'd go and have a few drinks as part of the the remembrance yeah, yeah. Of, that's why we yeah. isn't there something tied to like the whole getting the hangman executioner drunk as well and not well, doing it right you or were something. you were allowed you were allowed a certain amount of alcohol on the on the way and they would stop at taverns. I mean, yeah. all executions were in in the UK, as you can probably imagine, were, were pretty boozy occasions. Mm. I think, yeah. but they were they were at least framed around this notion that what they would do is symbolically deter for a while, yeah. weren't they? Jo? I was going so, to say that that's why they were in. Uh, that's why they happened. They happened in the market square, basically, yeah. or in really really prominent places. And it's interesting to know that that people like Dickens goes along to public hangings. Mm. You know, so so but although big event. Weren't they? It's Absolutely. like what you're doing, what going on, what doing on Sunday, go to church and watch events. hanging. Yeah, we'd started to build a tube in London, so something really quite modern, and people were able to travel on the tube to go and watch a public hanging. That is, that Absolutely is fascinating. fascinating. And, again, and, and, again. Do, and Dickens, Eve, people used to rent first floor, second floor rooms with balconies so overlooking the hanging so they could actually watch it. So th- this is, you know, when we talk about a modernised or civilising society who were able to do this sort of thing, yet they were still watching these public events. And that's partly because there was a real encouragement. People were expected to go along and watch because it was the, det- the deterrent value. The, the other fascinating anecdote to this is there's evidence to show that far more pickpocketing went on <laughs> mm-hmm. at these public events than any other sort of events because so, of the amount of people there watching and transfixed. So, so pe- the deterrent effect wasn't it? That's right, yeah, well, it depends in- what you're trying to deter, really, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, but... But yeah, so so those I talked a little bit earlier about in in the sort of 1940s, 1950s, and into the 60s, those abolitionist debates around capital punishment. But they were and they were actually happening in the 19th century as well. So we started having those um, those abolitionist events, and we talked about James has just mentioned about the booziness of these these events as well. So towards the uh, middle part of the 19th century, so 1840s, 1850s, going into 1860s we start to see these debates again about how these events have become less of a deterrent more of a sensationalist gruesome you know people were going along because of that aspect rather than the deterrence but also because they were getting drunk it, they become really rowdy and therefore they aren't having the solemn aspect to them that that was intended so one of the answers to that was to move executions behind prison walls so we started to build prisons around about the 1850s and again that's another topic for you know the, these crime tapes we can discuss that later but we we build lots of prisons in the the 19th century 
and we move these executions behind prison walls so that they no longer become public events. That's partly because of sensibilities. People don't want to see it anymore, but also partly because they become rowdy events that the people that are still advocating the death penalty um, are saying, this isn't what we want. We want it more certain. We want it more solemn. Um, so we're going to move it indoors. Keep Joe drunk and public out, That's right. out of the That's right, absolutely, way. absolutely. So those abolitionist voices carried on right through into the 20th century. And as I said before, you know, we, we have those debates towards the end, uh, you know, when we start to suspend that uh, that punishment of hanging. So Ruth Ellis was the, the last woman to be hanged in Britain. And she, she was hanged after... You know, I talk, we talked about Derek Bentley, you know, one of those cases where um, the, the innocence of the person's being questioned. So Ruth Ellis was, she, she, 1955, was hanged for shooting her then lover, David Blakely. And essentially, when we look at that case, as Annette Ballinger's looked at it really very closely, so, so she's the academic to look up if you're interested in this case. So Ruth Ellis was, you know, she, she, was, she was a high-profile model and a nightclub hostess and she was going out with David Blakely and she she I mean she is clearly guilty of that crime in that she she was found with the gun she was seen to shoot him she shot him five times um, and and obviously he died but in fact what people don't realize about that case is the fact that um, David Blakely had treated her really, really badly during their relationship and she'd not long lost a baby, had a miscarriage because he'd beaten her and punched her in the stomach. So there's evidence to show that there was violence going on in that relationship and she was almost driven towards killing him. So that was a case that, that was again another another of those high profile cases where there was a lot of debate around whether or not she should have faced the death penalty. And then we come to the case of Myra Hindley. Now we all know we all know what happened there, you know, the the case of, of her and um Ian Brady. Ian yeah. Brady, yeah. Take, taking those children and killing them and burying them on, on the moors and you know, we we still don't know where some of those babies have been buried. But in fact, those two were prosecuted and found guilty at trial just after the death penalty had been suspended. So in fact, they didn't and would have faced the death penalty had it not been suspended, but they didn't. And they were both sentenced to life in prison and, and at that point, the whole life tariff. And there's only about, I think it's about 80 people at the moment still on whole life tariffs in the UK. So everybody else, those 80 odd thousand people in prison will all come out of prison at some point bar a very, very few that are there on whole life tariffs that we keep them there. And both of those, so Ian Brady is still alive and still... Oh, did he die recently? I think he's died recently. Yeah. recently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, OK, he's... died recently, but again, still died in prison. But again, Myra Hindley died in prison. Ian Brady never asked to be released. Myra Hindley did continually campaign to be released, and she wasn't allowed to be released. But in fact, these whole life tariffs were... You know, I, I talked about the debate on the, the, you know, the suspension of the death penalty in Britain. So one of the ways that the public and the parliamentarians were swayed to allow this suspension of the, the death penalty was by introducing whole life tariffs. Yeah. So the fear was was that you got really dangerous criminals that should be hanged. Yeah, so this is what we call incapacitation. If they're dead, they can't do it again. And those debates still happen now when we're thinking about paedophiles and people that rape and then murder. So, you know, the question of they can't be allowed to do this again. Yeah, it was that that introduction of the whole life tariffs that appeased those voices that said we can't, we can't remove do the this. Death penalty. Yeah. And I suppose in some ways it's pretty spectacular because if you think of the the Moore's murders, you know, that must have been a real test yeah, to the, to absolutely. The, the the sort of legislature because the public I mean Ellis was quite a sympathetic case in some ways. The, yeah, the British public didn't like the fact that, that she was hanged. Um there was there was quite an outpouring, wasn't there? I think even Raymond yeah. Chandler, the, yeah. the author, wrote yeah. a letter sort of saying 
yeah. you know, the, if the law can do this to a, a, a woman, it's barbarous. Yeah, that's uh, whereas, right. Uh, whereas in contrast, you know, I, I imagine a, a large section of the public would quite happily have endorsed, you know, yeah. e- executing yeah. Hindley. And that's why she was never released from prison. Yeah. Because although there is a lot of evidence to say that she really was a reformed character and a totally different person towards the end of her life than she had been, you know, in those early days when, when the the murders were taking place um, and, and there were a lot of sympathetic people, there were, there were a lot of people that were campaigning on her behalf yeah, Lord Longford, the yeah, president I was gonna mention, campaigner yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. There's, again there's another great because um, we quite like, uh, Kyla quite likes stuff um, there's there's a, a, a great film um, or t- a TV programme that I think was called Longford um, and the name of the, the guy that um, plays him but he's in everything um, uh, George, Jim Broadbent oh god I can't oh, remember yeah. Jim Broadbent I don't know that film yeah no it's great um, Longford and I can't remember who played Myra Hindley but similarly that was um, it, it was one of the you know the new generation mm-hmm. of great female actors but um, but yeah Jim Broadbent um, of course played Lord Longford Longford, the BBC film, sort of charts the relationship he had with with Hindley, which is, again is really interesting if mm. uh, if students want to watch it. Yeah, so obviously we moved to to suspend the death penalty, and over that period, you know, from from 1850 to now, well, to present day, actually, imprisonment became the dominant form of punishment. So we moved from killing people to locking them up, and some of those people locking them up for life, and and that's that. You know, we've got a massive prison population now, but you know, if we look over in the states they have they still have in some states a death penalty and they still use a death penalty in those states but they also have an absolutely massive prison population so in fact they've got both and the interesting question is is that not necessarily why they also um have such a high prison population rate i mean we have the highest in europe they have the highest in the world capitalism yeah okay all right so it's all so Carla says it's all around capitalism and, and I'm not disagreeing but that's a debate for another time but the question is is that why did we and many many western countries suspend the death penalty where we've got quite a few non-western countries like China and some middle east countries that still have the death penalty but why we got a massive capitalist Western country like the states, and we and they've still retained in some states the death penalty, and you know in some of those other states that they, they've retained the death penalty, but they don't actually use it. So there are only a few states that use the death penalty, but why? Why you know has that happened? And that's a really interesting question. And there are there are some interesting sort of criminological debates at and around that, aren't there? I mean, yeah. um, David Garland, a, a British criminologist, spent a lot of time in the United States of America. Uh, spends a lot of time um, in his work thinking about. I mean, he talks about the, the sort of peculiar institution of yeah, that's punishment right. in Absolutely the United fantastic States of book America. If anybody it's great. Wants to it, read it is it. a great book. And and I think there is a sort of um, there's something that we don't appreciate at times I personally and this is just a personal hypothesis I think there's something we don't at times appreciate in, in the United States which is we as, as outsiders to the United States look at the US as a collective mm-hmm. but actually it is a, a collection of yes, states it is. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 different and there's very like different the, the light, yeah. psychology yeah. Yeah. dependent yeah. on yeah. which those yeah. states are and who populates yeah. them yeah. and the legacy That's and right. the heritage mm-hmm. yeah. so the southern United States and the confederate states very different from Absolutely. states in, in the north yeah. for example differences between the east and west coast and, yeah. and yet we kind of look over and we go well, America has the death penalty. It's yeah. not necessarily the no. case. It's it, the death penalty is where it's retained and used. I think is is far more in the Bible Belt, and yeah. and in, mm. and, and it, I think it, it very linked to uh, a justification found classically in sort of religious retribution. You know, yeah. the eye for, for an, an eye, eye rather yeah. than yeah. the more modern yeah. interpretation. There is that, but there's also the racial element. But there's also yeah. the racial yeah. element yeah. as well, which so, comes from so, slavery, which yeah, is part of Garland's right. focus too. Yeah. And I think yeah. likely a combination of both, perhaps. That, mm-hmm. that it's a, it, it's about a sort of racist system yeah. because when we look at um, the, both the miscarriages of justice that we covered in the podcast but also the use of mass incarceration and then yeah. e- punishments of execution yeah. and capital punishment in the yeah. United States yeah. it's used disproportionately yeah, against the black it's, population it's, it's yeah, modern it day is. Jim Crow laws isn't it it, it, it abso- is absolutely yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so you find it sort of although we aren't much better 
Well, we, this, we do have we do have our own issues there. We can't sit in high judgment. I don't think moral judgment in the UK. I think we could have a whole conversation on that. Well, I think a good place to end as well, though, is we we, we sort of started off, and, and in some ways, people and, and listeners might think that this is, a, and, and we've mentioned it briefly, that it's something of an irrelevance to think of the death penalty because it is just history now. Mm. You know, even though abolition, is, as you mentioned, Joe, happens fairly recent history. Yeah. But is the lesson in some ways perhaps that we shouldn't be complacent about the fact that that we don't Absolutely have a death not. penalty, and yeah, that, no. that rather than that, it's the exception is our fairly recent history of not using execution yeah, rather yeah. than the other way around. Absolutely, and I think if we look at public support for the death penalty, so public support has always been there, and even when we suspended the death penalty, public support to retain it was still really quite high, and ever since it's stayed really high. So, you know, in the late 20th century and the 21st century when we haven't had it, the polls have suggested that should it be put to a referendum, then it would be reintroduced. Mm -hmm. Um, And even now, I think that there is still a whole swathe of the population that, you know, if faced with, let's say, a paedophile that's that's raped and murdered, let's say, 10 children, if you ask the population, I think the majority would say that if we had the death penalty, that would be the person that would face the death penalty and should face the death penalty. So public support is definitely still there. So if we if we leave the European Union and if we leave the European Convention on Human Rights and we're no longer bound by those um, restrictions on whether or not we can have the death penalty, we leave ourselves then open to the reintroduction of the death penalty in the UK. And yeah, so a, a scary, perhaps, and sobering thought. Although some may may support it, and and it'd be interesting to know what listeners think necessarily. Yeah, and uh, yeah. because you know, it, it is one of those things, like I say, that we tend to think of as as past and bygone. But what I think we've seen today is we can learn an awful lot from history, and that is one of the the topics that students yeah. would necessarily sort of cover in in criminology. Yeah. Um, so all it really remains for me to do now is is to say um, thank you ever so much, Joe Turner. Um, Dr. Oh, Joe Turner for, for joining us. I'll come um, again. <laughs> brilliant. And I think there are already, already plans afoot um, to basically thanks our production team. Um, if you want to find out more about our courses, including criminology, which Joe, Kyla and I all, all teach on, or any of the other courses here at Staffordshire University, you can visit our website staffs.ac.uk where there's more details also if you like this podcast do check out iTunes Buzzsprout and Spotify um, and do look at the other podcasts in the the Crime Tape series Um, and thank you very much to Kyla hello goodbye and thanks to Joe and thank thank you you from me Crime Tapes couldn't happen without the remarkable students and staff in the Staffordshire University School of Law, Policing and Forensics. If you're interested in finding out more about a future in crime prevention and investigation, education is your next step. Make sure you get a good start by visiting University Open Days before you make any decisions. Staffordshire University's next Open Day is on Sunday 1st of December, where you can meet our team of experts, tour campus facilities, explore new and exciting courses, and find out everything you need to know about higher education.